Let's start with the Saturday late afternoon game on NBC. The Las Vegas Raiders taking on the Cincinnati Bengals. This is a compelling game in my mind. The Raiders, a great story, the way that they got into the playoffs, a, a, a stirring performance this year after John Gruden's abrupt resignation, after the Henry Ruggs situation, the horrible DUI that resulted in alleged DUI. I mean, it's all still pending in the court system, but the car accident that claimed the life of a 23-year-old woman and her dog, I mean, it's just horrible, and it created distractions and adversity, and the Raiders survived it all to get to the postseason. They are the five seed after winning on Sunday night. The Bengals are the four seed. The Bengals are five-point favorites. The line has crept in the Raiders' direction. It was six and a half. Now it's down to five, over under of 48.5. And I've got my picks locked in. I can take a screenshot and send them to Pete if you think I'm going to play any games here. I'll go first anytime you want me to. I'll go last anytime you want me to. You decide. You want to go first with this one or you want me to? Well, I'll, I'll go first. I trust you. I do. And you're usually very ethical in the fact that while I'm describing the matchup or whatever, you usually type it in there before I say my score. So I, I do trust you. We can continue that. I will I will rotate with you as far as who leads it off, just for the banter, for that aspect of it. Um, I'll lead this one off, though. No problem. Uh, we'll go there. I, th hey, this game, you know, this is, this is, this is to me – the reason you kicked the field goal if you're the Raiders at the end of regulation last week. It is. Because you, you, you now have put yourself, to me, in a position to maybe advance another round if you're the Las Vegas Raiders as compared to, you know, if you went for the tie last week, you'd be going to Kansas City and a team that, you know, outscored you 90-something to 12 or something like that this year. It was a crazy differential. The Bengals game, I know they lost. It's going to say 32-13 from the first matchup. The score is misleading. That game was, you know, they, they, they were toe-to-toe -to -toe for a big part of it. As you heard me say the other day, it was 16-13 with over a little five minutes left in the football game. And then the Raiders had a late turnover and messed it up from there. So that's where it fell apart. But I certainly think the Raiders are capable of winning this football game. The one thing I look at, too, here with the Bengals offense, Mike, you know, they're the big play Bengals. That, they couldn't figure out how to get a big play against the, the Raiders defense the first time around. That was a real issue, and I don't expect that to change. You know, Gus Bradley, the inventor of the Seattle scheme, he's still the master of it and the little nuances within it, and, you know, they do a phenomenal job of really not letting up many big plays in a football game. You know, even last week, there was no big plays until, okay, gosh, it's fourth and whatever, and we're going to lose and the season's over, and then – uh, Justin Herbert forced the issue into some tight windows on must-have-it situations. But you could see that, and that's where I worry about the Bengals. Here's the, my biggest concern for them, and to me the number one thing that can ruin the game for them, at least on the offensive side of the ball. The Bengals are not great at pass protecting. If they don't have answers to block Yannick Ngakwe and Max Crosby, they're going to they're gonna flirt with being upset at home in, in, their, in their playoff game. You know, the first time around, and Gakwe and Max Crosby got there early in the game. Joe Burrow fumbled. The Raiders picked it up or turned it into inside the 10-yard line. That led to their, their first points of the game. You know, so to me, that's something they have to be wary about. I think this is a game that the Bengals' offense is going to have to be a little patient on that side of the ball and realize it's not going to be about stats. It's going to be about a little bit more surgical. we got to run the ball, be efficient and play that style of football to where it might not be as sexy as we've come to know with the Bengals on, you know, their offense. So, all right, well, I wasn't sure. I didn't even get into the Raiders de uh, the Raiders offense versus the Bengals. We got defense. plenty of time okay. to go back and yeah. forth. Okay, that's what I was going to do. I was going to just kind of break down that side first of going a little bit here just to give you my two cents on the Bengals offense versus the Raiders defense and some Let me let me let me let me ask you let yeah. me ask you some questions cool. And, cool. and share my perspective here cuz I agree with you they have to keep the the Raiders pass rush away from Joe right, Burrow. Right. That game was played so long ago, though. Both teams have changed since then. Yeah. They've gotten better since then. They both have gotten better since then, I think. The issue with the Bengals has been consistency. And what we've seen from the Bengals, and Joe Burrow told me after they beat the Ravens, I think it was week seven in Baltimore, when, you know, we – We've had several different occasions this year where we've said to ourselves, hey, the Bengals are pretty damn good, and they proceed to lose the following week, uh, sometimes two in a row the, fall, you know, the, the following two games. But week seven against the Ravens, whenever it was that they went to Baltimore, 
that was when he first started to notice the heavy double teams of Jamar Chase, which opened up the rest of the offense, whether it was Joe Mixon running the ball or T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, C.J. Uzama contributes a, a splash play from time to time. And we saw what happened when the Chiefs didn't commit to taking away Jamar Chase, the historic day that he had, which really nailed down the offensive rookie of the year award for him. What do you think the Raiders will do about Chase? And if they overcorrect to take away Chase, will they leave too many openings in the rest of the offense for Joe Burrow? Yeah, I, I don't think so. They're they're not one of those teams, Mike. You know, they're one of the, the Raiders are one of those defenses where it's like, again, it's 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 Seattle three. It's Seattle three, it's Seattle three, it's cover one, man to man as the curveball. They don't they don't do some of the stuff that we talk about. It's very, very rare that they double somebody or go outside the realm of what their scheme is. You know, they're again, their corners are a little they're a little bit like, hey, let's be wary of where this guy is. Hey, we play our cover three, but they change some of the rules and the nuances as, you know, as compared from one week to the next is going, you know, oh, this team does a little bit of this more or does a little bit of that. So they tweak the rules and how they play it to a degree. And uh, that's where I see it. It's, it's, it's going to not be any different. Now, where I look at it to where I go, like, you're right. The Bengals offense is more explosive and better now than it was at that point when they played the Raiders. There's no doubt. They've opened it up more. They have more avenues of, of ways they can beat you on that side of the ball. The, the Raiders, uh, the, the Bengals have not shown me great understanding of how to move the ball against the scheme. Even when you get into the Jets game, there's a little, there was issues there at times moving the football. That's the same defensive scheme. Robert Sala was up there in Seattle you know, with Gus Bradley. So that's where I don't know if there's understanding of the scheme and how to, you know, crack the code or break the matrix is what I'm saying. But the one thing I do think they have, because it's that three deep all the time, it's going to be like one-on-one on the outside. And the Bengals towards the home stretch of the year, they got a little bit into, wait, you're going to play man? Then we're just going to play our guys better than you. He's going to get open. Joe will throw a strike. And we'll take the 15-yard comeback or the 20-yard out route. They'll do that. And that, to me, is something they can do, I think, to exhaust uh, the, St- the Raiders' defense a little bit more and-, and get the ball into Chase's hands more than they did the first time around. Exhaust is a key word, too, because the narrative as to Sunday was the Raiders are much better off winning the game and facing the Bengals than losing and going to Kansas City. But the problem is... They had the 70-minute game on Sunday night, and they turned around and play in Cincinnati on Saturday afternoon. Now, when we saw that back in week one, week two, they had the overtime game at home against the Ravens. They went to Pittsburgh the following week. I said, there's no way. They got no chance against the Steelers in Pittsburgh, home opener for the Steelers. They had just beaten the Bills. They're traveling across the country. They played late in the the night on Monday, and, of course, the Raiders won the game 26-17 straight up. So I I don't know how much stock I put in that, but it's, it's not easy. It can't be easy when you have a tough, grinded-out win with your playoff life on the line. You win it literally at the 70-minute mark, and you got to pick it all up and turn it around and come up with a game plan and figure out what you're going to do and get your guys healed and get your team ready and have it rested and take on a Bengals team that that was able to rest some of its guys. They, They folded the tents for the most part against the Cleveland Browns in Week 18. I think that's a huge factor. That, that can't be overlooked here. Because I, I was saying going into that game on Sunday, you can make the argument for either one. You could argue that they're better off facing the Bengals. You could argue they're better off with the extra day yeah. and playing a Chiefs team that they know very well that they beat at Arrowhead Stadium in 2020. And I know a lot's changed since then, but it's not like it's an automatic W for the Chiefs if the Raiders had come to town. It's not an automatic W for the Bengals. All right, flip it over to when the Raiders have the ball. We've seen different guys step up from time to time this year. Derek Carr has played well more often than not. Josh Jacobs has done a good job in the running game. Darren Waller needs to get healthier and be more of a contributor than he was earlier in the season. But what do you think about the Bengals' defense against the Raiders' offense? Yeah, it's it's an it's another interesting one. You know, first off, like watching that game back, the Raiders' receivers had a hard time separating from the Bengals' secondary. They did. You know, again, without Henry Ruggs. 
You know, and I know they got Deshaun Jackson, but he's he's not as fast as Henry Ruggs was or is. You know, they've 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 lost a little bit of like that guy that put pressure on on a defense to go wait. They could call a post route or a go route with this guy at any moment and strike for seventy. So you know, and the, the, Zay Jones, good receiver. Renfro, good receiver. Now these they got some guys in the secondary in Cincinnati. They could they could cover them. They covered them when they played man to man. They were all over some of the scheme stuff that the Raiders want to do. You mentioned that the Raiders are better at running the ball now than then. That certainly should be another aspect. But the one thing that jumped out about the first matchup, and you just brought up his name, the Bengals had no answer for Darren Waller. They had none. And we saw George Kittle go off against the Bengals. And to me, this is the guy that they're going to be able to use as their biggest pawn or chip in this football game. They got into a little bit of a – a, a, a mojo in the third quarter of the last football game where they had uh, had Waller set off to one side as a receiver by himself and then the other three guys on the other side of the ball. And it really put the Bengals in some issues because they were like, wait, okay, you know, we can play a soft zone and whatever, but now we might leave these three receivers to find little holes in that soft zone. Wait, play man-to-man, and we don't have a guy that can really match up with Darren Waller and play him that way. To me, that's going to be the guy that I think the, the Raiders are going to formulate this game plan around and really go, we're going to feed him until you do something extraordinary to take him away to help out some of our other guys who might not be as explosive or dangerous. He had 116 yards. That was a season high for Darren Waller when they met in week 11. He played week 12, didn't play week 13 through 17, was back for week 18, two catches for 22 yards on nine targets. So working to get back yeah. into a rhythm and a chemistry with Derek Carr, and I don't know how much the Raiders can really count on him. Now, if this is the week that the switch flips, it, it could be a problem. For the Bengals, right, if right. if Darren Waller is healthy and able to make a difference, but you know the vibe changes when the season's on the line. It does, and and the Raiders just played a game where the season was on the line. Even though the tie would have still gotten them in, they had to get in position to tie. They had to hold off the furious charge by the by the Chargers uh, up fifteen. The Raiders were they blew that. They had to hold on. Uh, you know, th there's there's some of that mindset that no I think doubt. is important that no creeps doubt. into into a team, and the Bengals haven't been there yet. Right. You know, they, they, they're, 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 now Joe Burrow told me a few weeks ago that they viewed some of these late regular season games like playoff games because they don't have playoff experience. But see, they're getting their playoff introduction against a team that, for the most part, has guys who don't have playoff experience either. Yeah. It's new for them. Right. Derek Carr didn't play in the game five years ago because he had broken his ankle in week 17 and wasn't available for the postseason game the following weekend. So there's a, there's a lot of, of inexperience for both teams in this one. And, you know, I look, I, I, you, let, let me, you go ahead, go, go ahead, make yeah. your pick. Well, listen, I, at the end of the day, I, I put I, mine in here. Uh, Mine's in here. I, I, yep. I see it. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I think the Bengals are the better football team. They're at home. You said it. Yeah, the Raiders don't have much of a playoff advantage other than like what you said. Last week, they kind of played that game and the Bengals got to sit back and sip on pina coladas while they played the Browns. You know, I, But I don't think that's enough of like, oh, wow, the Raiders will be ready for playoff football that much more greatly than the Bengals. I think it's going to be a close football game. I'll say that. I do. I'm going to take the Bengals, but I'm going to have the Raiders covering the spread. I'm going to go 21-17 Bengals in this one. Yeah, I got 31-17. I think this one is eventually going to go the Bengals' way and get away from the Raiders. I think that there'll be a point in the second half where they just kind of let the air out of the tires. And, uh, you know, a, a Jamar Chase big catch here, a Joe Mixon touchdown run there, and that 14-point margin is going to happen. So we agree on the outcome. Yeah. We disagree on the spread. You've got the Raiders. I've got the Bengals. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.